Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm Max Anderson, the Eugene McDermott Director of the Dallas Museum of Art. And I want to thank you for joining us this evening for a conversation about collecting, inspired by the exhibition Face to Face, International Art at the DMA. The DMA has not only acquired extremely significant examples of Western art from antiquity to the present, but also splendid examples of art from around the globe and across time. And the exhibition next door is really a tribute to the key donors who have shaped the museum's collection over 50 years and helped establish as an international art destination the Dallas Museum of Art. I'm delighted to moderate tonight's conversation with our four panelists, and I will introduce them in turn from here, and then I'll go join them. Margaret McDermott was born in Dallas and studied at Sweetbriar College and the University of Texas at Austin. And after college, Margaret served as a reporter in India, Japan, and Germany. She worked part-time at the DMA, which was then known as the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, in 1948 to 49 in public relations, fundraising, and membership solicitation. So watch your wallets tonight. In 1954, she married Eugene McDermott, a geophysicist, inventor, philanthropist, and co-founder of Texas Instruments. In the 1950s, the couple established the Eugene and Margaret McDermott Art Fund, the largest endowment ever in Dallas for art acquisitions. A DMA supporter for over half a century and a lifetime benefactor trustee, Margaret has established a number of endowments for staff positions and internships, enabled the museum to acquire over 700 works of art, and supported several of the museum's programs and exhibitions. The Eugene and Margaret McDermott Foundation, headed by her daughter Mary, continues to make significant contributions to the museum and many other institutions in Dallas. And Margaret and her family have been catalysts for the arts and set the standard of philanthropy in Dallas for younger generations to model. Marguerite Steed Hoffman received her BA in Classics from Oklahoma University and her master's degree in art history from the University of Virginia. She worked as an art dealer, as director of the Gerald Peters Gallery, and founded her own art consulting business. And like Margaret, Marguerite worked for the DMA in marketing and public relations. In 1993, she married Robert Hoffman, who shared her passion for contemporary art, and they collected significant works by Johns, Guston, Richter, Kelly, de Kooning, and many other major figures. Together, they made substantial contributions to advance contemporary art at the DMA by bequeathing their collection to the museum, along with the Roses and Rachofskys, and by establishing the Contemporary Art Initiative and the Hoffman Family Senior Curator of Contemporary Art. For over a dozen years, Marguerite has provided strong leadership for the museum in many capacities through her work on the collections and trustees committees, service as chairman of the board, and as co-chair of the Centennial Campaign and 2x2 for AIDS and Art. A native of Dallas, Dan Beckman graduated from the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, and received his MFA in creative writing from Columbia University. He currently serves as president of Turtle Creek Holdings, a private investment company. The Beckman family has supported the DMA for generations. Dan's mother, Elizabeth, has served as an active trustee and chair of the Acquisitions Committee. The museum's library is named in honor of Dan's grandfather, Frederick M. Mayer, who preceded Margaret McDermott as president of the Dallas Art Association from 1959 to 1961. Dan has served in a variety of capacities on the DMA Board of Trustees since 1999, including as chair of the Collections Committee. He and his wife, Laura, a painter, have collecting interests in Mexican folk art and Mayan ceramics, contemporary photography, Texas artists, American modernism, and Italian decorative arts and literature. Dan's passion for literature has spurred him to collect first editions by the greatest names in contemporary literature and to support the museum's library series, Arts and Letters Live. Dr. Ann Bromberg has been affiliated with the DMA for over 40 years. Returning to Dallas after receiving her doctorate in classical art and archaeology at Harvard, she began the museum giving lectures and docent training and then became a curator of ancient art. After working with a major museum donor to build up our Hindu and Buddhist collection, she assumed her present title, the Cecil and Ida Green Curator of Ancient and Asian Art. Anne has overseen the presentation of numerous exhibitions, including Face to Face, Pompeii AD 79, Splendors of China's Forbidden City, Tutankhamun in the Golden Age of the Pharaohs, and the Sensuous and the Sacred, Chola Bronzes from South India. She and her husband, Alan, have traveled all over the world, photographing significant artistic sites 
and building their collection of art ranging from New Guinea to India to Africa. Please join me in giving them all a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for being part of tonight. We were in the green room, free associating a little bit about what to expect. The room is full. The lights are up. How's our energy level? We good. feeling good? Good. We're ready for our encounter, and I promise it'll go easily. And there will be time for questions from the audience afterward. So I'm excited about that, especially since I have a script that they have exciting questions. <laughs> I guess I'd like to start, Margaret, with you and ask you a bit about the beginnings here when this was really before us, the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, and what led you to get involved to start with? Well, I'm asking the audience and everyone to remember when. And when was in the 40s, 1940. And I'll admit that is 70 years ago. And 70 years ago, I was traveling quite a bit overseas, living in different countries. And in between my travels, I would like I'd come home to Dallas to check on my father and mother. Dad was blind and I would come home to see how they were. Then I would get impatient to get overseas again and I would leave. leave. Now, during that time, Jerry Bottlewalters, who was a personal friend and a neighbor of me in Harlem Park, my family, would call and ask me would I do public relations in between times for the museum. And I was delighted to do so, delighted to get away from my domestic duties that I, <laughs> that I really felt I ought to take seriously, and I tried to. And so I was PR at the museum. Now in the 40s, the museum was quite a different place, but it was great fun, and it was small, small staff. I think the staff at that point, Ann, was something like, <laughs> Twelve? Right. Well. <laughs> Max. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah. Of course, Anne was in Harvard, and the, oh, she was in, where were you, in Harlem Park? Harlem Park. Probably at Harlem Park, yeah, Park. before Harvard. So in any event, uh, in between, and I had great adventures, and I certainly loved the collection that the museum had, and so, I had a grand time, and I would go away on a trip and write my friends in the museum. When I'd come back again, there was Jerry's phone, and uh, I think the one story I had to tell, in those days, the great football player was um, the Doak Walker, Doak Walker. And so, with PR for one of the things, uh, one of the exhibits, I had phoned Doug Water, Walker and asked would he come out to the museum and help us out with publicity. And he and some of the other SMU football people came out, and I had two or three little boys with the football players. And it was a wonderful picture, and the boys were absolutely ecstatic that the great Doak Walker, they had their picture made. Well, everything was great until the next morning when, to my horror, instead of a four-column four picture, it was a three-column picture, and one little boy had been cut out. Ugh. Well, the grandmother called me right away. <laughs> <laughs> I bet she did. <laughs> and said that the little boy was sobbing and said he was going to kill himself. <laughs> and I said, you know, there's no, and I say this again, 
You know, you can't tell Miss Whoever she was. You can't tell what the news is going to do. <laughs> and I still think so. <laughs> so in any event, I called up Joke Walker and said, there's a little boy that needs to see you. And that nice gentleman came back and had another picture made just of that little boy. So that was a success. I'll say. The next thing that I was was married, happily married, happily to be married. And uh, then my husband, who was everyone's favorite, everyone's favorite, was asked to absolutely be the head of every organization that he had any interest in. And he had a habit, because he was asked to so many, he said, he would say, well, i sorry I can't do it, but Margaret would love to. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say, I said to him, Gene, I don't want your old has been. I don't want your old <laughs> rejection. So no more. Well, anyhow, and this was in the 60s, 60s. Your grandfather, Fred Mayer, came to Gene's office, this is what I heard, and said, Gene and your grandfather had been present for eight years of the museum and said, Gene, it's your turn. And without hesitating, said, you know, Fred, <laughs> I know even less about art than you did do. He said, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, Margaret, Margaret loves art, so why don't you ask her? Well, I do love art, and I do think that the new museum in Harlem Park, not in Harlem Park, in Fair Park. And so I accepted with great pleasure and worked hard, worked hard on it. And the one thing I worked hard on, on Max, was getting the Fair Park Museum together with the Contemporary Art Museum. And the Contemporary Art, just like contemporary art in the world, the people in the contemporary art are passionate. And they did not want to belong to the old, foggy, old-timer <laughs> Fair Park Museum. But anyhow, and this is interesting, the key to that situation was my friend Al Meadow. And Al Meadow, up to now, had sort of bankrolled the contemporary, and he got a little tired of it. So anyhow, the two museums did get together. And I have to admit, but it was the truth, that one of the ways that the contemporary art got together was if, and I was president, of course, if I was not on the board. Well, you know, I said to my friends, now they're friends, now they're <laughs> I said, you know what? You can ask me anything that pleases me more than not to be a member of that museum anymore. I said, I've worked hard. I think this is a good deal. I think it's a good deal for anything. But, you know, I'm tired of staying at home and writing thank you letters. <laughs> <laughs> I said, now, listen, I'm leaving. And I won't be back at all. And I was off the museum for 10 years. But let me tell you, I had a good time with art. I did a lot at MIT with the art. I did a, quite a lot in New York with the International Council with MIT. And it was grand. It was when Harry Parker first came to Dallas. Harry was 33 years old. And he was so charming, so nice. And he came to me and said, Miss McDermott, 
isn't it time you came back to the museum again? And I said, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, I need you. And that was so appealing to me. And so I did join the museum again, and that was in the 60s. And here I am, and my only, at this late stage, the only thing I want to do is to go to the good parties. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> well, that's, that is terrific. Me too. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> and, and good parties, we're, we're very happy to offer you and celebrate. And there, there is so much to celebrate over that tradition of support and generosity. And Anne, I would just turn to you, because Margaret's painted a picture of earlier days. And if you would take us to your beginnings at the museum and a bit about the collecting that you started here when you joined us uh, after finishing grad school. Honestly, Max, what I should begin with is not so much what I was doing, but what my husband's parents, Juanita and Alfred Bromberg, were doing, who uh, were good friends of Bart and Jean McDermott and all of the people who at that time were involved with the museum uh, and were great art collectors. Uh, my family had been friends with the Bromberg family since I was a small child, and I thought they were among the most civilized people I knew. They had art all over their house. They believed they had social consciousness. Uh, great people. And that whole generation, while Margaret was talking, I was just thinking, that whole generation of people who in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, you know, really made the museum and, and changed it and increased the collection and so on. At, in the period that Margaret's talking about, like in the early 60s, when the, the old Museum of Fine Arts did the, the absolutely seminal show, The Arts of Man, which is, was really the sort of starting point for the face-to-face -face exhibit that's here now, because mm -hmm. The Arts of Man in 62, 63 was the first international show that the museum had done. They'd been strong in Texas art, you know, in contemporary art. And, so on, but they really hadn't gotten into non-Western art, and that was the beginning of it. And truthfully, the big collectors associated with the museum have never looked back since that exciting show. And Margaret is quite right that one of the other great things that happened around that time was the uh, getting together of the Museum for Contemporary Art, which had been a separate institution, and the Museum of Fine Arts to form a unified museum. Uh, and I think the people who had been involved with the Museum of Contemporary Arts would love it that people like Marguerite and Howard and Cindy Ryszkowski and so on are now <laughs> helping us become a great contemporary art museum. You know, I mean, it's a long time building, but we're really there. And that's even more true in the areas that I've been working in where, for instance, from the Arts of Man exhibit in the early 60s, donors bought significant works that are still highlights of the collection, like the Vishnu in attendance in Indian mm -hmm. art, uh, the great uh, Javanese Ganesha sculpture, uh, pre-Columbian pre pieces. Uh, just That was when people started thinking that art isn't just European and American art. And that's how we ultimately got the great um, wise collection of um, pre-Columbian art, uh, how we eventually acquired in my area the, uh, one of the finest collections of classical gold jewelry, Etruscan, Greek, Roman, uh, around. And I think that we, really it's very suitable that Margaret McDermott was the first person to speak because she's throughout her long career supporting this institution. Margaret has always said, it, it's going to be us working together, people, friends, working together. And that's what I remember about my parents-in-law, that their wonderful house with Matisse and Henry Moore bronzes and Prince, they were the founders of the Dallas Print and Drawing Society, that all these lovers of art got together in their living room and talked about what can we do for the museum. And they did it, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were a real booster team, that whole group of people, the Marcuses, the McDermott's, the Brombergs, and so on, um, and Al Meadows, uh, just 
they really felt that it was their civic and personal obligation to buy great art for Dallas, to turn Dallas into an art center, which is inspiring. Um, and I think that the development of the collection over the years, from decade to decade, from director to director, reflects the consistency with which the big donors to this institution have done it. And I think it's, it's not perhaps surprising that in my, I started out as a classicist, as Max said, and worked with ancient art to begin with, but almost by a fluke, David Asley, who came from, da uh, was born and came from Dallas. His parents, Colonel Alvin Asley and Lucy Ball Asley, were friends of my parents. Um, but when we, through actually Emily Sano, Rick Battelle's deputy director, when Emily Sano asked David to have a show here of his art collection, and he did, and it looked wonderful and everybody loved it. I can remember when we had Hindu and Buddhist art up and down the concourse for months and people were just hypnotized. Here were all these sexy Indian sculptures. <laughs> it was a big hit. And uh, the then director, Jay Gates, said, you know, David, if you leave these things here on long-term loan, we'll find a gallery for it. And they did. And we've never looked back. We now are reaching the point of publishing our South Asian collection. But David also, you know, is a friend of Margaret McDermott's and proud to be it. Um, Margaret bought the finest piece in our Indian collection, the Shiva Nataraja, in David's honor. Several people pooled their money and efforts to buy the piece, not just Margaret. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, that's typical to me of the very upbeat and positive and enlightened way that the collectors in Dallas have thought about making this a fine museum and an international museum. Yeah. Well, Dan, you're in a family that goes back a couple of generations of support, and I wonder if you could share some anecdotes about that involvement. Well, I'm glad to find out that um, my grandfather didn't know anything about art. So <laughs> that is, I've been wondering why I became a collector, and that was, it was to make up for that uh, glaring oversight in my family history. Uh, <laughs> Margaret's covered a lot of the uh, time when my grandfather was involved. He was there when they were merging uh, uh, the two museums. Uh, he was there when they established the Foundation for the Arts, uh, very instrumental in getting the O'Hare donation, uh, which was very important to him. But he was a businessman uh, more than he, he loved art and literature, but he was not a collector. Uh, so he really focused on the business side of the museum, and you'll be happy to know uh, this. I think it was... Uh, John Lunsford, who told me that everybody, the whole staff of the museum was forever indebted to my grandfather because he got them health benefits and retirement benefits. So you need to thank me for that. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> we can talk about it. Uh, <coughs> but he was always, uh, as a lot of people did back then, he served on numerous, as you mentioned, uh, civic boards, but the Museum of Art was always the one by far that was uh, closest to his heart. So he, he loved this place. And uh, I think he laid the cornerstone of this building as the oldest uh, living trustee, which he wasn't very proud of that, but uh, <laughs> it was just a... Skip forward a generation then, you would. Uh, well, one generation, whatever uh, recessive gene that he had in collecting <laughs> uh, went insane in the next generation through his uh, two children, my uncle and uh, my uh, mother, uh, my uncle who grew up here and uh, then went to East College and then moved, moved to Denver and was a great friend of uh, Margaret's, uh, was he would collect anything, and the intellectual pursuit of, of collecting or of putting collections together, and he was a great patron of the Denver Art Museum, but he collected stamps, and uh, he had a Costa Rican jade, a great collection there that's now in uh, Denver, but he always looked at putting a collection together. Whether he, it was something, an area he was passionate about if he thought the museum in Denver 
or, or at Yale needed a certain area to be filled in, he would just go full blown on that. And then my mother, uh, I grew up in a house that was filled with pre-Columbian, and my uncle was a big pre-Columbian collector. And I remember pre-Columbian dealers staying in our house uh, all through my youth. And then she went on to collect uh, Native American pottery, large pre-Columbian collection, and uh, American modernist paintings. But she also thought putting the collection together was more important than the individual pieces. Mm -hmm. I guess they were making up for my grandfather as well. <laughs> we're gonna come back to your taste. I'd love to turn to Marguerite and just touch a bit on your passion for collecting. And maybe we could start with something that a lot of people aren't aware of. It's your recent and very deep involvement with medieval manuscripts. Can you share a little bit of that? Yeah, that's kind of uh, odd, isn't it? Um, but it makes perfect sense in the kind of arc of my experience um, with loving art. I went to graduate school, like Max said, um, and fell in love with medieval and Renaissance art and uh, really wanted to go deeply into that, uh, primarily because it all happened over there and I'd have to travel, you know, to see it. <laughs> and being from Oklahoma, which is a great state, I'm sure, but, um, you know, didn't offer a lot of eye candy. I really like to travel, and um, so we have that in common as well. But uh, make the story quick. Um, I didn't end up being a medievalist because I needed to actually earn a living by being involved with art, and it was clear to me that there were a lot more opportunities for someone like me in the contemporary field than um, trying to fill a gap that was about that big. Um, that I wasn't prepared to fill. So I turned my attention towards contemporary art. And you've kind of seen the evidence of that particular passion, um, and it's been greatly fulfilling. But after, after Robert died, um, I needed something that to, to sink my teeth into that was fresh and different. And I also have to say that this is probably too much information, but um, after also the bequests were announced and fast forward happened, I felt so much pressure collecting in contemporary art. I, I, I felt um, that I needed some space to um, reaffirm my joy in art and not feel so responsible. So stupid me, I, I said, well, you know, I've always wanted to go to Maastricht Art Fair and they don't have contemporary art there. Well, they did, but I didn't know that. And so I'll just go, and I'll enjoy that experience. I will not feel responsible for carrying the mantle of the you know, collecting community and contemporary art from Dallas. I won't have to be a poster child, which I'll always disappoint in. So um, I went to Maastricht, and within an hour, I had gravitated to, of course, the one place that had uh, medieval manuscripts. Um, and it was like going backwards and reconnecting with that old passion that I'd really enjoyed. And um, I ended up staying in that rare booksellers booth for five hours that day. And he was a um, kind of a difficult um, Swiss German gentleman. <laughs> Um, who Imagine still thinks it. I'm an, probably an idiot. I mean, I, I think I had this blinking light that said, you know, here's a sucker, you know, <laughs> she doesn't know what she's doing. Uh, this will be a really good opportunity. But over the last two years, um, we have developed somewhat of a friendship, I think, a hopefully one of trust. These books, I, all of you come over, they're just gorgeous. They're just really remarkable, and I feel really privileged to have them. They're very private. You have to stand still. Uh, you have to actually sit still. You have to take your time looking at them. All those things that I really need, um, it's like a palate cleanser for our life right now, which is so dense and 
multi-layered, multitasking, so many demands. These books of ours are demanding in a different way. And so maybe this is just a therapy for me, um, but it's been a great, mm -hmm. a great therapy. Margaret, when I hear Marguerite talk about the oasis of her collection, your collection is an oasis. And it would be wonderful if you would talk a little bit about when you began to be interested in 19th century French painting. What, how did that start after all these experiences you've had? Well, after we married, my husband was generous. And I said to him once, you know, truly, Jane, it's wonderful what you do it for education and science, but we don't have a single picture. And finally he said to me, go buy a picture. <laughs> so I did. And that's what, and we went together, the two of us. And never, ever did we ever buy a picture that we didn't like and we didn't love. And that just sort of happened, what we were shown. And every picture that we had, and now my pictures in our house are, some of them are, I've had 60 years, some 40, and the babies are 30 years old. <laughs> 30 in my house. So I know where a lot of the pictures have been, most of their life, most of the artist's lives. So uh, just because we liked them and loved them, and to this day, I don't go through a room that I don't look at those pictures in a different light and love it. And I'm gonna go right while I said and go back when. That pictures really, I had a group that when a new picture would come in, we'd, they'd come over, we would look at it carefully, we would study the artist carefully, we would talk about it, and in those days, you could take a picture and keep it month, two months before a call would come from New York or Paris or wherever and said, well, when do you think you can make up your mind? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, art has brought more friends in my life. And I've got to say just one thing in closing about my young friends in, who love, who are passionate about contemporary art. There is no art that I don't enjoy looking at. Some of them I don't want to buy, and I don't buy them. But some of them I love to see what's new and what's happening in the museum. And it's just part of the world. Mm -hmm. There. That's, that's very true and helpful, Margaret. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret, just to follow up, though, you, you go through your house and you see these artists' works, and how much interest do you have in the lives of the artists? How important is it to you that you know a lot about the lives and history and biography of the artists in your collection, as opposed to them being beautiful pictures? Well, you think of the artist and you like to see the pictures of the artist. You like to see what some of the self-artists, that they paint their own portraits. And that's interesting. But knowing about the artist is part of having a picture that you love and look at it and you wonder and you think that maybe someday that he was, had a wonderful day. And you think it's some others. And you think today wasn't all that great. <laughs> and so anyhow, it's part of it. Yeah. Well, Anne, let me ask you, in terms of ancient art, antiquities, you don't know the artists. They're long gone. We have no connection with them as people. How different is it to collect in that area versus the areas that Margaret and, and Dan and Marguerite have collected in? It's very different. And I would say that's true of a lot of art around the world. You know, if you start thinking about art from the perspective of Europe and America, you think the artist. But in most other countries, you don't, it isn't just antiquity, you don't know who the artists are. You have very, very brilliant craftsmen, who we would now call artists, who in effect produce something 
that is known by the purchaser and not by the creator, which to us seems odd, but that's the way it is. Um, and certainly in the kind of art that uh, not only I'm involved with in collecting for the museum, but that Alan and I collect personally, it's more a question of going to New Guinea or the Cameroon or uh, South America or somewhere and looking at something, or even in America, we collect Pueblo pottery, going and looking at a Pueblo pot. You know, is, does this appear really finely crafted, really beautiful? And that's pretty much what you do in antiquity or in Hindu or Buddhist art too. You think, how well is it made? What does it look like? What does it express? Um, and I've got to say, how do you feel about it? I think if most collectors were honest, it's your gut feeling <laughs> that you really go by. But I thought the list of questions that were passed around for this conversation, one of them was, did your, does your spouse join with you in collecting art? And I would like to say that, I mean, it's so natural to Alan and I, that, but it's amazing. I started as an anthropologist, so as soon as we got married, I thought, fine, we'll travel to some very odd places um, and look at what they made in the way of art. And Alan wanted to do just exactly that. We have never had an argument, never even had a discussion. We're on, so much on the same wavelength. Alan is the kind of, speaking of spouses, the kind of spouse who is perfectly prepared, as we did quite recently, to spend weeks wandering around New Guinea trying to find the perfect slit gob. Uh, which is in his office at our home. Um, but, you know, you have, to, you have to cultivate your eye, your judgment. Your, you have to know a lot about the craftsmanship. To me, learning about how people make things, sculpture, pottery, painting, whatever, is as important as who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and training yourself to think about what the craftsmanship in the object you're thinking about living with is. But the other thing is, in thinking about our personal collecting for this conversation is that we inherited a um, number of very fine artworks from Alan's parents, including Matisse Prince and a number of small bronzes by Rodin and Henry Moore and Mayo and so on. And, uh, and, and, and they weren't all Western either, we, we have a very fine African Dogon door that they had owned that was in their stairwell, in fact, throughout their life. And those things, largely Western and modern, um, coexist perfectly happily with the African Oceanic um, things that we have collected over the years. Their Egyptian um, ibis, sculpture looks right at home with, say, an Indian sculptor of the god Shiva's Nandi bull. Uh, it's, if you want to, our house is really an example of the fact that if you like art from anywhere, by anybody, that they do speak to each other. They're remarkably symphonic together, and that's very illuminating, uh, it seems to me. Dan, bring us a little bit up to date in your collecting tastes and habits, and you were sharing in the green room some very well, untoward stories, so well, maybe you can share some. My here. relationship with my wife is different than, <laughs> than your, your marriage, but I'll get into that briefly. But uh, I had a, uh, you, what you just described, I put together a uh, large collection of Mexican folk mm -hmm. art, and I think what you, and I'm probably David Owsley too, is you first fell in love with the culture mm -hmm. and yeah. maybe you used the word anthropology and that's what I was thinking and in the uh, 1980s I was spending a lot of time in, a, in Mexico. I'd grown up going to Mexico, going to all the ruins and the colonial cities uh, with my family and then I went on a associate's trip to Mexico City and I probably hadn't been to Mexico City in 20 years and it was so illuminating it was this great city close by easy to get to and uh, there was a lady who was a curator at the anthropology museum in Mexico City and uh, we became good friends and I'd go to Mexico to see her and we'd go to these uh, 
small towns, usually in the state of Michoacan, where they were still producing folk art. I'd grown up uh, seeing a lot of folk art from in Santa Fe and in my parents' house, and I always loved it. And then most of it was utilitarian, and it was going to disappear. Uh, plates that you buy clay plates from someone down the street. It was cheaper to buy plates from Asia, plastic plates, and I was worried it was going to disappear. So for 15 years, I went to, uh, as often as I could, remote parts of Mexico and took pictures of the artists. And it, as we discussed, made them sign, mm -hmm. sign receipts for everything and took pictures of them and interviewed them and bought lots and lots of work. And it outgrew my house, and I'm happy to say we donated it to the uh, Tyler Museum of Art. And then my wife was a studio photography major, and I came late to photography and, in fact, didn't understand it very well when we were first married. And uh, I remember I was looking at a case spear flooded monastery one day and I said this is just so gorgeous and all these pieces came together and since I'm the uh, obsessive compulsive person in our family I immediately went out and bought 40 photographs and uh, <laughs> irritated my wife uh, and she felt I was slightly infringing she's a wonderful person on her area of expertise and so we started looking at photography together and uh, we have to agree on anything that goes in our house, and we have a lot of, lot of agreement there. But she likes to uh, come down to my office every two or three months to see what we didn't agree on and where I put it, <laughs> <laughs> and if I've been lying to her. So, <laughs> so that's, that's a, that. <laughs> well, Marguerite, I think that's a great setup because having heard a bit from Ann and Dan about the tangle and wilds of far removes of New Guinea and rural Mexico. Tell us about the contemporary art scene and the adventurous quality of collecting in a field where there is no less uh, mystery and unwritten rules and... Oh, wow. Just give us a, <laughs> yeah. some texture. It's the Wild West, for sure. Um, I, I think the contemporary art world is um, segmented, just like every aspect of art and just like every aspect of humanity, uh, there are some really interesting, very sophisticated, dimensional, curious uh, people that collect art, and there are some real horses patooties that collect art and do it for all the wrong reason, in my view. Uh, it's my humble opinion. They have not asked for that opinion. But um, so I, I approach the contemporary art world with a lot of trepidation. Um, I, I want to find the people within that sphere that I would like to have a conversation with about any subject. Um, I'd like, I'd like to find the people in that um, group that can remember the difference between the object and the collector, that they're not synonymous, that the collector has the privilege of living with something or acquiring something but they didn't make it. You know, they didn't have the idea. They, they, uh, I, I think collectors sometimes wear the artist like an outfit, um, which I think is inappropriate and not respectful. So um, I like, there, there aren't so many like-minded people um, or people that you really want to hang out with. And <laughs> but the good news is that most of them are here in Dallas. And um, we had great training, uh, and it really, when I say this, is going to sound really corny, uh, but it's a privilege to be on the stage with all of these people, Max included. Um, the degree of knowledge, experience, the, all the chords they've hit in these comments about, you know, the personal experiences, what it meant, the, the civic endeavor, uh, what it meant to have the social aspect of it, which is so fulfilling, and then, you know, the power of the object itself, collecting with friends, collecting with a lover. I mean, it's, it's all really powerful stuff, 
And when you can find your little tribe um, that reflects on these things the same way, it's, you know, that's pretty much like a home run. Mm -hmm. And then when you can do it to help an organization, an institution, and a community, you know, it's just amplified. So for me, it's, it's just been mm -hmm. tremendous. Margaret, you, you made some joint purchases with friends over the years, too. And Dan was describing arguments and dis dissonance in what he was chasing. Can you share any of the works of art that you went after with Nancy Hammond or the Clarks or Ida and Cecil Green or any other works that you bought together, supported together? Well, there are quite a few and they're all important. And let me tell you that one thing that art has done for me and has made me more great wonderful friends of all ages, and I like all ages, young ones most of all, but mm -hmm. I like them all. And so that's done one thing. And uh, I think the biggest one we did was the Wise Collection. And the four people got together, and Al met him, my friend, he was the one that really sort of brought us all together. And Al brought the Murkisons, of course, John Murkison, when I was president, was chairman of the board. And that was another friend that I'll just always be grateful for Art for bringing us together. And then the Hammonds. The Hammonds and, of course, Nancy. And I think it's interesting that one of my really good pictures, best pictures, are going to be given because it's well known that my pictures are going to be given for the public good in this museum. And I want you to know that I'm giving that in honor of Nancy. And Nancy gave a wonderful mug grief in my honor. So that's the other thing. So there it was, the Meadows, the Murkison, the Hammonds and the McDermott's. And we always felt really, really close ties to each other because of the Wise Collection that I think people have enjoyed. It's been great for the school children, and I think it's getting more important every year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I wonder, as a curator, you've often pursued objects, and. Can you share a little bit about what it's like and what it was like years ago to go hand-to-hand -hand combat with other curators who were pursuing objects or chasing things that might have felt hard to get, dealers that might have given you a, kind of a challenge and that you surpassed and overcame? Do you have any anecdotes like that? Well, you know, truthfully, well, bidding at auction, <laughs> it's, you're, it's not so much the dealer that's causing you the mm -hmm. trouble as it's the competition. Um, but, in fact, we have been significantly lucky in getting things without that much hassle. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking particularly back to Cecil and Ida Green when they got really with, you know, I won't say it's effort free and obviously it cost money, but still there was no real sort of competition for getting our best pieces of ancient art, the figure of a young man and the Roman figure of a woman. Um, interestingly, even the gold, classical gold collection, that's because the owner, who was elderly and near death, wanted to sell his collection to a museum. And the people here were sufficiently, you know, quick on the uptake and able to raise the money. Mm -hmm. Again, thanks to Barger. <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's, it does, I, I do, other curators that I know who don't work in Dallas do have considerable difficulties. I mean, well, okay, here's, here's a personal there story. I was in the same, no, I was in the same class in graduate school at Harvard in classical art and archaeology with Dave Mitten, who succeeded our joint tutor, George Hanfman, one of America's most distinguished classical archaeologists of the middle years of the century, and Dave succeeded George Hanfman as the head of 
classical archaeology at Harvard. Anyway, I was, uh, got together with Dave at the time we had just purchased the gold jewelry collection and mentioned getting it. And he said, good heavens, we'd never be able to do anything like that at the Fog. And I thought, is that really true? <laughs> but that's what he said. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it is true that, it, I mean, Harvard may be Harvard and the Fog may be one of the finer museums in the eastern United States, but they aren't necessarily the way collectors are in Dallas. You know, gung I mean, here, I guess it's partly that Dallas is such a new city that, if you can think back, as I can, to what Dallas was like in 1950 and what it's like now, they could be two different worlds. And I think the enthusiasm for building up art for this museum in particular, and you know, for themselves as collectors in general, has been a very positive, we can go forward, we can be better. And that's not necessarily a sentiment that exists in the East Coast, say. Right. Well, uh, can I ask Dan, do you have one that got away? Do you have an object you pursued and <laughs> failed to get? Well, I do, and there were some in the folk art that I wish I hadn't bought because there was this, uh, several things sat on a roof in Mexico City for almost six months while I tried to figure out how to get them back. But uh, this isn't really the, how, how it got away, but... Uh, one time when I was chair of the collection committee, uh, and it did get away, uh, I, when I actually, I was just on the collection committee. I came in out of, from out of town and hadn't looked at, to review everything and was going to do it at the meeting and walked into the room and there were two things my mother had promised to me that we were reviewing <laughs> and those got away. <laughs> so I, I regret that, you know. <laughs> From a yeah, that pataka, and there was a Peruvian altar, altar. Thank you so much. Yeah, so that got away. <laughs> and there was a family. Uh, I have to say, my mother was trained well. Uh, Margaret, we talked about. There's an impressionist painting by Serusier here in the museum that I think you were with my uh, grandparents when they bought it. And I grew up in the house my uh, grandfather built, and was always on the wall of the house that I lived in and that with the understanding that it was my mother's painting and I went away to college and one day I came back and said, where's that? And my grandfather just come over, removed it from the wall, brought it over to the museum and gave it to the museum. And so, <laughs> so. Such a good impulse. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like to encourage everybody to do that, wow. yeah. <laughs> Margaret, do you have an anecdote about a work of art that you gave us this picture of this genteel world where people would send you a painting and wait for a month to hear back from you. Was it ever otherwise? Did you ever have to rush and make a decision in a hurry to buy something? Yes, <laughs> of course. And there's times that maybe there wasn't pressure from the dealers, but there was a pressure on how much you really wanted it. And then you make a, up your mind quite quickly and I guess the thing that I took time in purchasing the pictures in our house is that it was so much fun to meet, have a glass of wine, talk about the artist, talk about what they're doing. And so friendship and interest and fun come right into it. Do you have I, do ha I do have a, um, a couple of great stories. Um, you, we um, have several pictures by Gerhard Richter, and um, I'll try to make this the par three version, but when Robert and I first got married, um, I was just hell-bent that we would buy, uh, try to buy a Gerhard Richter candle painting. And one came up at auction, um, it was uh, 1994, 95, we were recently married, we didn't feel very uh, flush. But I remember Robert was trying to be really nice because we were newly married and um, we were in New York and we'd seen this picture and we were having our um, methodology was that we'd go around and look at everything and then we'd go back to our hotel, have a 
cocktail, you know, and talk about everything, write them down. Um, and then we'd have this really deep dive when we realized we couldn't afford any of it. Uh, but it was the, the getting up there to the high, that was really good. Um, so this one night, this picture from the Gates Lloyd collection of the single candle was coming up, I think it's at the bees, and uh, Robert could tell how much I was admired of it. I admired it, and he said, okay, okay, this is after one or two scotches. You can bid, have, and he said, have you ever bid at auction? I said, yes, I have. Have you? No, I haven't. He hated auctions, hated being out of control. Sorry, I'm, I'm making this way too long. Uh, so we go to the auction. He said, well, you can bid up to here, and it was, I said, we'll never get it for that, and he said, well, you don't know. You can try. So we go to the auction. We sit down. You know, it's a it's a kind of a circus, and the picture comes up, and your your heart's kind of going like this. And I had the paddle, and um, you know, start on this lot. And you know, Max and I have talked about my impatience and my desire just to kind of get things done. And so I, you know, I stuck my paddle up. He goes, I thought you said you'd done this before. I said, I have. This works. It scares them. I, I, you know, I <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I go hard at the beginning, and it just it wipes out all the pretenders. He's like, all of a sudden, I had this elbow to the side of my ribs that I thought I might have lost one. And he, I said, and he's pulling on my arm. He goes, I said, what are you doing? We're not even close to the to what we agreed on. He goes, I can't do it. I can't take it. You're making me crazy. And so. Uh, yes, we lost that one. <laughs> <laughs> so we're standing on the, you know, um, street afterwards. I'm seething because we kind of create a little scene. People are looking at us like, oh my God, they're going to duke it out right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the picture had gone for twice the high estimate. And I turned to Robert and I said, see, you don't know everything. This is a great picture. He said, oh, Marguerite. Do not worry. This market is very frothy. He said, we'll wait until Richter candles come back down. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, OK, you are one of the smartest people I know, but you do not know everything. And this will go the other direction. And the coda to the story is it did, as you've seen, the Richter market's quite healthy. And um, we did jump in at a, another moment. and. Um, I had to push hard on that one, too. He was just obstinate. But we have now a beautiful double candle that will come to the museum, and I'm really happy about that. Thank you. <laughs> We'd love to open up the questions now to you. And we have a couple of microphones going up and down the aisles. So if you have a question, if you could wait to ask it before you get to the microphone. Otherwise, I'm going to have to repeat it, and I'll mangle it. So please, if you have a question for any of our panelists, do feel free. We have one in the second row. Oh, okay. I have a question for Dan. We have some very nice pieces of pre-Columbian mixed tech and Zapotec art from Monte Alban and from Mitla. Sure. Can you recommend anybody who could evaluate these? I have no idea what they're worth now. Is John Buxton still around? Yes. John yes. Buxton would be, do you have an idea? Is that? She's not allowed to comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, there's a deal, there is a dealer here um, that I think can help you out. John Buxton, yeah. Yes, I'm an art teacher. I teach elementary art here in Dallas. And I just want you to know how wonderful it is. We just had a little teacher meeting before this and talked about the fourth grade trip where we get to come and bring our fourth graders to the museum and how wonderful it is that we open their eyes to the world of art. And um, we talked about it being like a cathedral when they come here. So many of the children haven't even been downtown. But then to come downtown and come into this museum and they're just awestruck and they leave here different. And I just want you to know how much it means to us that you support education and support the Dallas ISD and help us bring the children here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, 
I would just tell you, I started my morning for a couple of hours at a Montessori school in South Dallas with fourth to sixth graders with a Go Van Go experience, which was transformative for me as well. So we're grateful to you for bringing your students here. Has there been, has there been any movement for South American countries to reclaim Colombian art, such as the Machu Picchu collection? Yes. Uh, Dan, would you like to talk to them? Well, I think you know more about okay. patrimony and what's going on now than I, than I do. So. so it's a long answer. I'll make it very short. The UNESCO Convention of 1970, which was adopted by the U.S. Senate in 1983, began to set up bilateral agreements between the U.S. and several countries in South and Latin America. And the terms of those agreements proscribe the sale of objects within the United States without an export license of multiple categories of works. And so on the UNESCO website and on the U.S. Uh, websites that are, deal with trade and antiquities, there are plenty of links to those, you can find the specifics. But yes, there is a fairly tight restriction today on works of art that can be imported into the United States and sold. And frankly, our, our ICE officials, our immigration customs officials, are trained to recognize things as they may attempt to cross the border. So it's an evolving landscape, and it's one in which these agreements are renewed every five years with each country that petitions the United States for them. Okay. We couldn't have possibly silenced you. I'm <laughs> confident of that. Um, this is a question for the entire panel. Uh, I, I get the feeling that in this day and age that the, the sale of a work of art is almost as important or more important than the work itself. And I would just like to ask all of you if you have that feeling or if, there, if you feel that artists, there are artists today who still feel that their work is more important than what they make off of it. Marguerite, would you like to take that? Yeah. Well, um, I believe in the act of creativity, and I hope that if people want to be artists, feel they are artists, that they will, you know, um, make art for its own sake. But the reality is people have to live and uh, have to make a living, so there is a marketplace, obviously, and, and there are gradations, and the marketplace is not is not a charitable place. It's, um, when I said I, I enter into contemporary art world now, uh, what I really meant with trepidation, I really was talking about the marketplace. Um, and it's unregulated, and um, you just have to kind of know what you're d doing. Um, and I feel artists, you know, I. I think about the ones that are living and watching their prices go at auction, their pictures go at auction, for instance, um, and setting world records. And I, I think, how do you take that back into the studio, that knowledge, and do something with it? Or are you petrified and, and terrified? So I think a lot about, about it. Um, but um, it's exciting. Uh, it's necessary, but you really have to be careful, and I think you really ha always have to bring your mind back to the object itself and to the creative impulse. Um, the, when you start thinking about the dollars involved, it skews everything. It changes the conversation. It changes the way you look at things. It changes the way you uh, act towards them, the proprietary nature, the... Um, it's, it, it just gets everything gummed up. It, it's real, and you have to deal with it. You have to write the check. Um, but I, I think it's very important that we don't think of collecting art like having a portfolio. It, it has to be something else. I was with the artist Chuck Close once when a very well-meaning lady asked him, do you go to the art fairs? And he said, that would be like livestock going to a slaughterhouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's not pretty. No. It's really not. Yes, over here. Yeah. 
I've really uh, enjoyed y'all's talk tonight. This is my first one, and I'm a DMA member. I'm thrilled Thank to be you. here. What advice do you have for a young burgeoning art collector? I'm 26 years old. Um, how do you how do you advise me to build my collection? And just to let you know, I really like old maps and art glass. Good. Well, know? let's go around the, the chairs, Anne. Would you kick us off? Yeah, actually, what you should first do, it seems to me, is study by yourself um, the public library. Uh, try to find out if they're map dealers or whatever subject you're interested in in the area and just go and look and try to find out what's out there. I think the first thing to do is really, you know, sort of education for you before you plunge in. Um, then you have to, you certainly have to think about, you know, what resources do you have, how much can you afford to spend, but um, it really is true that it's your interest, your passion, uh, you know, what you want that is going to determine how you build up your collection. And the first place, to my mind, that you would start would be learning more about who handles the material you're interested in, what is its historical background. The more knowledgeable you are, the better you'll be able to assess a work of art when you buy it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I think we'd all agree with yeah, that. Sure. Dan, do you have any? Well, I obviously agree with all that, but also, generally, you have a great resource here and you have curators that love to answer questions, talk to people, um, and they're very, people don't, I don't think really use them the way they should, but they're very accessible and they're the greatest source of knowledge about their own chosen fields that you're going to find, and they love having phone calls, and well, maybe they don't love having phone calls, <laughs> but they'll take your phone call. <laughs> As a curator, I have one addition to that. Don't ask for a mu museum curator to give you an appraisal for a work no. of art you have either acquired or thinking about because we don't do that. There are professional appraisers who do that. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. I, and certainly my colleagues are, and, and I are all perfectly happy to talk to you and give you advice about you know where you could start um, and where you could find the information. This museum has an excellent library and with a very helpful staff, which a lot of people don't even realize. Margaret, would you have a piece of practical advice for a young collector starting out? Yes, and my advice is take a chance and buy a picture and put it on your wall and look at it and see if you like it this week next week, next month, next year. Or if you don't like it next week, give it away or sell it. And so just take what you like. And everyone has different tastes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you have a tip, Marguerite? Well, I would only say go online to the auction houses and look mm -hmm. at, maybe you already done that, at the material that's being offered. It, it, uh, for instance, I don't know about art glass at all, but I know in the world of manuscripts, it's just good to see what's out there. And that costs nothing. Uh, you can also get, you know, from rare book dealers, um, some of their catalogs, get on their mailing list. And that's another way just to see what's, mm -hmm out there and available and to get an idea of the price ranges. Um, I, towards Margaret's point, um, I do think just taking the plunge, don't overthink it, um, stretch a little bit, do without something. I had no furniture for a long time, but I had one great picture. Uh, well, it was great for me. And I, I saw it in a gallery. I could no more afford it than anything in The Man in the Moon. I got up in the middle of the night. I'm not kidding you. I'm not making this up. This was a long time ago. And drove my car that was falling apart down to the gallery. It was on the, the entrance wall. I shone my lights on that. I got the police came, asked me what I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, uh, I really need to have this picture. Well, I didn't have the money. So I went to the dealer, and I asked him. 
And this is the other thing. Bargain. People want they want to make a trade. So I said, I can't afford this. He goes, well, what can you afford? I said, well, <laughs> you know, I said this. And he goes, oh, my God. Okay, well, all right. And I paid that picture out over five years. And um, I literally did not have a couch. I did not have a dining room table, uh, uh, any table. Uh, I had a bed, a piano, and a picture. And um, I That's was... enough. I was happy. I was really happy. So try it. Try it out. You'll be surprised what you can do without, but you can't do without those things that sustain you, you know. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. If there, sir. Well, uh, from the education point of view and a little different viewpoint, uh, you'll see me once in a while down here at the visitor services desk. And any of you that come Tuesday through Friday in the mornings especially and see all of the school children that are here, it makes me proud for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret, do you have any closing thoughts for us tonight? Yes, I do have, and just one thing. <laughs> and we, I'm going to go back to remembering when, when the Dodgy Fair Park Museum and the Dashi Contemporary Art, we got together. Well, I think that there's one thing that I do want to say, and that uh, on the Dashi Contemporary Art were two people and one of them was Betty Blake, and the other was a lady that was gone now, but she lived in Cuernavaca. Well, I visited in Cuernavaca, and she gave the party of the year for me. <laughs> so that was one thing. Betty Blake. I was at Betty Blake's 90th birthday, and it was a wonderful birthday. Now, Betty has celebrated her 95th birthday now. And she and I were looking at pictures. I buy pictures, it was at my house. And I said to Betty, Betty, I really, my pictures are going to the museum. And I, and now Betty was, I was president of the Fauci. She was president of the Dashing. And in any event, I said, I want to have one of my pictures given to the museum in your honor. And she chose, when we talked about it, a sculpture, it's a Brock sculpture, that will be in her museum. So I kind of want to put the record straight that while they didn't want me there <laughs> then, they like me now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight to hear these great stories and thank each of our distinguished panelists for sharing insights and memories and advice and hope you'll come back for the next programs at the DMA and my thanks so much to each of you for participating. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to go back to the...